evening everyone and I'd like to thank you all for taking the opportunity to watch our presentation this evening. Tonight we have Josh Trevenza with us who will be presenting on Evo Can Evolution and Bible Decree. To begin our evening we'll open with prayer to God. Dear God, who rules in the heavens, hallowed be your great and your glorious name. We, th we are thankful that you have allowed us to freely discuss your word. We, re we realise there are many other countries where such freedom is not available. We know, dear God, that you offer us a hope for the time to come when the troubles that currently afflict this world will be over. A hope through which we may be given eternal salvation. Please be with Josh tonight as he presents to us from the Bible. May he clearly unfold your truth which is contained within it. And please be with all us who listen and watch tonight, that we may listen with open hearts and minds. Please may everything we do here be to your honour and glory. We ask this now through thy Son's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're now going to have a reading from the Bible to introduce tonight's subject. And the reading will be Genesis chapter 1, which I will now read. Reading Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made a firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called his seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding tree after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and living every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas. And let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth a living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, 
and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herd-bearing seed, which is upon the face of it, all the earth, and every tree in, which, in the which is the fruit of the tree, yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and, behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. After that reading, we'll now ask Josh to begin his talk on Can Evolution and Bible Agree? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our discussion here tonight. So now we're going to be looking at a subject which generally polarises people, the Bible and evolution, and can they agree? These are two ideas which offer very different opinions on how we as humans got to where we are today. This topic causes many hours of arguments and disagreements which seem to get bogged down in technical details that just cause confusion and makes people lose sight of the bigger picture. So. Tonight, we'll try and keep things very simple and just look at an overview of the key concepts to see if we can come to some sort of simple answer. I don't want to get too caught up with complex scientific arguments and theories, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, I'm not a scientist. I really enjoy reading about new research and the amazing discoveries scientists are making, but I'm definitely not qualified to give a talk on complex evolutionary theory. Secondly, I'm sure most people watching this video right now also don't have a background in evolutionary science. So if I try to get into complex and specific scientific arguments, we'll just all end up confused. Thirdly, and most importantly, this is a religious talk, and I want to focus more on the Bible than science. So, where are we going to go tonight? Well, firstly, I want to have a look at the evolutionary views of how the universe got here, how we got here, and think about the implications this has on us and on how it should affect our lives. Then I want to have a look at the biblical record of creation, what the Bible says happened, and what implications that should have on us and how that should affect our lives. Then we'll examine our findings and see if these two concepts can merge, see if they overlap, or see if they can even agree at all. So let's jump into it. So tonight I won't just be talking about evolution. The biblical creation record covers the creation of the universe right through to the creation of man. So we'll have a look at the most commonly held scientific theories on this same process so that we cover the same ground. We're really going to compare apples with apples. There are three theories that we will briefly look at tonight. The first of all is the Big Bang Theory, which is the theory of how the universe came into existence from nothing. The next scientific theory we're going to look at is abiogenesis. Now, abiogenesis is the theory of how life appeared. We have a universe from the Big Bang, but no life. This is where life started. Not complex animals, but how the very first living things came from non-living matter. But then thirdly, we move on to evolution itself. Now, evolution is the theory of how we came from these basic basic living structures to all the animals, plants and humans we have in the world today. Now first of all, the universe. 
how did the universe get here? Well, the overwhelmingly held view is the Big Bang Theory. Now, the Big Bang is a misleading title as space is a vacuum, so sound doesn't travel. So when this event occurred, it would have been silent. But the theory says that this incident happened very fast and it was big, like really big. That's the Big Bang. <clears throat> the universe began as a very small, hot, dense superforce, which by definition means a single unified force, which is a very helpful explanation. There was no stars or atoms or form or structure. This is something which is called a singularity. Then about 13.8 billion years ago, space expanded extremely quickly, thus given the name the Big Bang. This started with the formation of atoms, which eventually led on to the formation of stars and galaxies. Simplistically, the Big Bang Theory says the universe has a single originating point. There was nothing, and then all of a sudden it bloomed into this universe we see today, and is continuously expanding. Next we have abiogenesis. Now, abiogenesis is, is the theory of how life came from non-living matter. How this happened? Scientists have no idea. There are plenty of guesses and theories, but any attempts to replicate this event in a lab have not shown positive results. The general prevailing hypothesis is that this happened over a long period of time, with many processes of replication and self-assembly, with other events catalyzing and influencing this process, increasing the complexity of this thing until it eventually became some sort of basic living cell. Um, some theories you may have heard of is the puddle of soup which got hit by lightning or um, the soup which evaporated and then precipitated or rained down over some hot rocks or lava which then spontaneously helped form life. No, no one really knows. As the very reliable source of Wikipedia says, it is a me its mechanisms are poorly understood. There are many different hypotheses on how life came about, but all we really need to know is that there was nothing living, just non-living matter. Then by some process over time, we get living matter. This living matter is very simple and basic. Now we get to evolution. Evolution is the theory of how we got from this basic life form, this primitive cell, to everything else. The basic theory of evolution has three parts. Now the first part is, it is possible for the DNA of an organism to occasionally change or mutate. A mutation changes the DNA of an organism in a way that affects its offspring, either immediately or several generations down the line. The uh, second part is that this change brought by, about by a mutation is either beneficial or harmful or neutral. If the change is harmful, then it's unlikely that this, the offspring will survive to reproduce, so the mutation dies out and goes nowhere. If the change is beneficial, then it's likely that the offspring will do better than other offspring who don't have this mutation, so they will reproduce more. Through reproduction, this beneficial mutation spreads. The process of culling bad mutations and spreading the good mutations is called natural selection. As mutations, the third point is, as mutations occur and spread over long period of, periods of time, they cause new species to form. Over the course of many millions of years, the process of mutation and natural selection has created every species of life we see in the world today, from the simplest bacteria to humans and everything in between, the trees, the plants, absolutely everything. Now, on to a bit of history about where this theory came from. Well, the main proponent of evolution was Charles Darwin. He wasn't the very first person to think about it, but he further developed the concept and provided explanations for how evolution might work. Charles Darwin, when he was a young man, set off on a voyage that was many years long. He was employed as a naturalist on a ship. Um, this was in 1831 when the, sh his, the ship left. And his job was to observe and make notes on things he saw, as well as to collect samples of animals and plants and all those kinds of things. One of his more famous stops along the way was 
on, on this massive voyage, which went from all the way to South America for many years and then came, went down to New Zealand even. But probably the most famous stop on that voyage is the Galapagos Islands. On these islands, he noticed these finches. Well, they actually weren't finches. He, they were probably more likely from the blackbird or mockingbird family. But he noticed these birds and it made him think. He discovered on this group of islands 14 different species of these birds. They were in most ways nearly identical to the mainland birds, but they all had different beaks. All these birds had developed different beaks, beaks that suited the readily available food sources in the areas they inhabited. And this is where Charles Darwin started to really think about the concept of natural selection and the survival of the fittest. Animals which had traits better suited to their environment would breed, passing on their traits to their offspring. Those who were not so well suited off, um, not well, so well suited, would die off and not reproduce so readily. So this is survival of the fittest. Later on in his life, he published these findings in a book, The Origin of Species. The concept of natural selection and the survival of the fittest has been redefined and adjusted by scientists over time since the book was first published, but this concept is still held. Once DNA was discovered, it was speculated that life started as a simple life form and through mutation-induced changes, natural selection over millions of years developed into the life forms we see today. So if we have evolved from some basic life on a universe which just happened to pop into existence, what does that mean for us? Well, it means our purpose is to survive. All of this process is about living, adapting to survive better and to reproduce, to continue and improve our species. That's our goal. I mean, personally, there might be more stuff which you know, we may want or feel, but the whole purpose of life is to survive and to reproduce. So that's what we should be doing. Now we come to creation, biblical creation. The Bible record of how the world and humans came into existence. Now, first of all, we as Christadelphians believe that the Bible is inspired by God. This means that every, even though the Bible is made up of 66 books, each of the authors who wrote these books of the Bible were moved by God to write what he wanted them to write. These writings were all then later on compiled into one book with a cohesive and consistent storyline and a message throughout that is uniform. We believe everything contained in the Bible is true and accurate. It is the only book that gives us hope for an amazing future. Now, tonight's talk is not about proving the Bible to be true. That is a talk that is a full night in its own, and we it's a topic that is regularly covered on our Sunday night program. So if you want more information about this, please get in touch. So we believe the Bible is true and accurate. So what does it say about our origins? Well, as we read at the beginning of our presentation tonight, we read Genesis chapter 1. We're going to work through this uh, book together and go through the process and see what we have. Now, first of all, the story of creation takes place over six days. We believe that God has all power and has the ability to do anything and has a vast group of angels who are like his assistants that are able to use his power to do his will. His power is called the, his spirit or sometimes the Holy Spirit. And these angels have a very active role in the creation process. And we'll talk about that again in a bit. Anyway, let's go through Genesis 1 and see this process. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. This is the creation of the universe. We aren't given much info here, but it says that God created the heavens and the earth. We take this to mean the universe. When did this happen? We're not sure. The Bible just says God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. The beginning, it might have been billions of years ago. It might have been within the last 10,000 years. We don't know. 
All we know is that God did this through his, with his power. Now the six days of creation start. Now this is the time frame we look at. <clears throat> In verse 3, And God said, Let there be light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning, the first day. Beautiful. So, as we saw in verse 2, we have this earth which God had created, which had no form and void. This means it was like a wasteland. It was desolate. There was nothing there. It was dark. And then on the first day, God creates light. He calls the light day and the darkness he calls night, which is something we are quite familiar with, I hope. That's day one. Now, in verse 6, we get into day two. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. So now day two, we have the separation of waters, the separation of water on the earth from atmospheric water and the creation of an expanse. Now, there's lots of ideas about this process, but that's a topic for another night. But in a simple summary, on day two, God created the sky, which separated the water on the surface of the earth from the atmospheric water, like clouds and that kind of thing. Think of the water cycle. Basically, God created our atmosphere. So day two is the creation of our atmosphere. Then we read on in verse 9. And God said, let the waters under heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the waters that gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. So now we have the land and seas being defiled, the continents being separated from the water and the oceans being sort of created in their spaces. Now we continue reading in verse 11. And God said that the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seeds, fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, trees bearing fruit, which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And, the e and there was evening and there was morning, the third day. All right, so in this newly separated land, we now have plants and seeds. Notice it says plants yielding or producing seeds and trees producing fruit in which is their seed. The reproductive process for all these plants was put in place from the very beginning. And notice it says multiple trees, not just one. Multiple plants. So that's day three. Big day three. Now, verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be and let them be lights in the expanse of heaven to give light upon earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of heavens to give light on the earth to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. So now we have the sun, moon and stars being created. So what was this light from day one? Well, we're not sure. Maybe it was God's power illuminating. In John chapter 1, verse 5, it says that God lives in light. Um, in this context, John is talking about God's spiritual light, but other parts of the Bible talk about God living in a light which is unapproachable. Now, throughout the Bible, God is very often associated with bright light. So it's a possible that this originating light described on day one came from God himself. Um, it's also possible that God made the sun in the beginning as well, 
but then organized it into the solar system set up on day four. We're, we're not told the details about this. All this is just speculation. But the Bible's purpose is to give us spiritual guidance, to bring us to God. It's not meant to be a scientific textbook um, with all the technical details of creation. We're just told on day four that all these systems and the solar cycle of night and day begins. And that's day four. Now, in verse 20, And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth, across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with <clears throat> which the waters swarm according to their kinds, every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And the e there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. So now we have the waters and the land sorted. We have an atmosphere. We have night and day cycles, trees and plants. God moves on to marine and bird life. Notice again in verse 22, just like he did for plants and trees, that they, these animals are created with the ability to reproduce, to be self-sustaining. That, that's day five. Then we come to day six, the last day of creation. In verse 24, And God said, Let earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth, according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is in the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heaven, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the, there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So now this is a big day six. All the land animals and humans were made. First of all, we have all the animals. And then in verse 26, we read, And God says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So here God's talking to his angels, as I said before. They were very... Um, involved in the creation process, we believe. Now, image and likeness. Image means shape. And in the Bible, we have rec records of angels who came um, to do God's will and to interact with humans. And they look like us. Well, more exactly, we look like them. And God says they would make them in the image. And <clears throat> so God says that they would make humans in the image or shape of angels and after their likeness. Now, likeness means mental capacity. Now, we're different from the animals, aren't we? Because we can reason and use logic. But more importantly, we also have a conscience. Animals don't have that. They just have instincts. That's what separates us from the animals. And that's why in verse 28, man is given dominion over the animals. Because he has a conscience, this higher brain function. He is given authority. 
Notice in verse 31 also, it says that God saw that all he created was very good. And this is a very unique phrase which means something special. Um, if we read in the next chapter, in Genesis chapter 2, and starting at verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. So after man is created, he's put in this special garden which God has created, and it's his job to look after it. It's going to be his food source. And God says, You can eat anything in the garden you want, except in verse 17. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So there was one tree that he couldn't eat. Now God said, if you ate the fruit of this one tree, you will die. If you look at the original Hebrew word for die, because the Old Testament book of the Bible was written in Hebrew, the um, word for die actually gives the idea of the process of dying, not an, not an immediate death. So here we have man. He's been created and he's currently in a state where he is not dying. But we know, we know the story. Adam failed. He ate the tree and the mortality came into the world as a consequence of sin. Now, sin means disobeying God. So at this point, why did God allow this to happen? Well, the simple answer is that God created man to have free will. In other words, he'd have choice. And we'll come back to this concept a little bit later. So God created humans to be able to have choice. But he didn't just abandon his creation to man's very often bad free will choice. I mean, look at the world around us. Man, we're just destroying this planet. God has a plan. If we, we need to look at God's plan just to see this whole purpose in creation. If we look back at Numbers 14, verse, we look back in Numbers 14, verse 21. As a bit of background to this verse, this is in the time of the wilderness wanderings. The nation of Israel had been slaves in the land of Egypt, and God is leading them out of Egypt to their own land. But it's a long way, and it takes a long time, and lots of people are doubting God and are grumbling, and in many cases doing quite evil things. And this upset God. He's doing so much for this nation, was giving them food and leading them to a better place. And they were so unappreciative and wicked in response. So God says in Numbers 14, verse 21, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. This, this is his plan. This is God's big picture. In the context here, he's saying that no matter what people do or say or choose, the earth is going to be filled with his glory. This is something that is unstoppable. As truly as I live, God lives. He, he's an immortal being. This is a very definite thing. The world will be full of his glory, no matter what. Nothing can change that. So what is his glory? What does this mean? Is this some mysterious thing? Well, no. It's actually really simple. Come to Exodus chapter 33. Um, this is still in the time of the nation of Israel leaving Egypt, wandering in the wilderness. The other main character, apart from God, in this section of the Bible is Moses. Moses was the leader of the nation of Israel. Um, God was working with him to bring the nation to a new land where they wouldn't be slaves. So Moses goes up to a mountain and he's communicating with God. And he says in verse 18 of chapter 33, he says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. So he says, please God, show me what your glory is. I want to see your glory. And God replies in the next verse by saying, yes, I will make my goodness pass before you. And this happens in the next chapter. So in chapter 34, verse 6 to 7, we read, and I'll read from the New International Version here. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So here we have God's glory. It's a list of characteristics. God, who is a compassionate and gracious, so 
slow to anger, overflowing with love and truth. A God who is merciful and forgiving, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin, but will by no means clear the guilty. So we have these two sides to God's character. He has all these beautiful, amazing, patient, loving qualities, but he's still just and fair so that if you are guilty, you will get justice. The guilty are those who willfully go against God's command with no remorse. But if you try and you are remorseful when you go wrong, it says that God is forgiving. He's abounding in forgiveness. So how's this glory going to fill the world like it says in Numbers 14? Well, if we put these two verses together, we see that God wants the world to be filled with his glory, which is his amazing character. So his plan is to have a world inhabited by people who have these good characteristics, full of people who are reflecting God in the way they live their life, in their characters. <clears throat> the character is love, truth, mercy, slow to anger, forgiveness, caring, justice. Does this sound like the world today? Well, no, not at all. The world today is a pretty dark place. There's war and inequality everywhere. People are, are very selfish. And the world is all about taking what you can get and doing what makes you feel good, what you see as being right. The world is not a nice place and definitely not full of those characteristics which God wanted to see. So why did God let this happen? Well, he gave man free choice and a conscience. God wants people to serve him, but he wants them to choose to serve him, to do what he wants them to do. Not to be just like robots, doing what they're told, but choosing from their own free will to serve him. Now, this is sad because we're all dying, but God has given us a better hope. This isn't our topic tonight, so we're only briefly going to look at this really quickly, but if you want some more information, please get in touch. So briefly, why are we all dying? Adam ate of the fruit and he began dying, so why do we die? Well, the answer is in Romans 5 verse 12. It says in Romans 5 verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So through Adam and his sin, death came into the world. And death passes on to every man because everyone sins. If we turn over the chapter to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, we read this phrase. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is very plain. Sin equals death. Therefore all mankind dies. But what's the last phrase there? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. This is our amazing hope. Despite death, God has given us hope. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 to 22. So it says in 21, For since by a man came death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So here we see the same idea. Through Adam, <clears throat> who was the first man that was created, who sinned, all men begin all men die. We all inherit mortality. But through Christ, all men <clears throat> sorry, through Christ, men shall be made alive. Christ is the way that we can reverse the, this flow of death. So by one man, sin entered into the world. And through another, life can be given. How can this work? Well, actually, it's been a part of God's plan from the very start. God knew that Adam would fail. God knows everything, past, present, and future. But he still gave Adam the choice. Adam had the opportunity not to fail, but he did. And God knew he would make that choice. But he let him make it himself. And he had a plan to fix the situation with Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's son, his only son. But he was a human and had all the same struggles that we do. But he never sinned. Um, we all know from the Bible stories that he was falsely accused and crucified by jealous men and the government leaders of his time. 
So he was killed and he did die, but he was a good man. He never, he never sinned. So if we read before that the wages of sin is death, how could, how could he die? Because he, he, he hadn't sinned. Well, this was because he was a mortal man like you and me. But because the wages of sin is death and he had no sin, he was dead, he was put into a tomb. But after three days, he was resurrected back to life again. The, the grave couldn't hold him. He was free because he was free from sin. So he was raised up. And then after spending some time with his followers in Israel, he ascended into heaven where he is now, waiting for the right time to return. Now, when he returns, he will set up an incredible kingdom and all those who have chosen to serve God will get everlasting life. So this is a super fast run through, but once again, this is a topic, another topic we regularly talk about and not the topic for tonight. So, to recap, what does the Bible say? The Bible says the universe was created by God. It was ordered and controlled. The earth and all life was created in six days. God created humans to show his glory. He has a plan and a future for his creation. So now let's address the question we came to look at tonight. Can the Bible and evolution agree? Well, here's a little table I created, and we'll just go through the two columns and see what we come up with. So first of all, on the big bang, abiogenesis, evolution side, we have the universe originating from a single point. Then life randomly came about over time by some random chances and events. Then all plants and trees and animals originate from the same simple life form. Humans are just a product of evolution and natural selection. The purpose of life is to survive and reproduce. Death is just a part of the cycle of life to further natural selection. When humans die, that is it, there's no future. And because of that, there's no responsibility to, to anyone. We just random chance that we hear. On the other hand, from biblical creation, it says that God created the universe. It says that God specifically created life for specific reasons. It's not just random. Each plant, each tree, each animal was specifically designed and created and given life. Um, God specifically created humans and gave them conscience and free will. God created humans to show his glory. Death was introduced to the world through sin. Um, God offers an amazing hope, an amazing future. And lastly, we have responsibility because we have been created by God so that we have, there is, we need to respond to that in some way. So can the Bible and evolutionary theory agree? Well, quite simply, no. The biggest conflict, I think, between creation and evolution is death. Death is needed for the evolutionary pro for the evolutionary process to progress. But we looked at the verses in Genesis and Romans in which the Bible tells us that death was only introduced after man sinned. And these two concepts just can't work together. Some people have um, tried to sort of merge the Bible and evolution together. I've tried to suggest that the Bible... Um, story of Genesis is just simply a story. God used the evolutionary process to create life and species and he created the first basic living cell and sort of guided it through the evolutionary process until it got to man. And the story of Genesis was just made up for people who have simple minds and can't comprehend the complexities of evolution. But the Bible is true and contains literal and historic accounts. There are cases in the Bible, sure, where metaphorical language is used, uh, but mostly that is in Revelation or some of the, the book of Revelation or some prophecies like Daniel. Revelation tells us that it is a book of signs and it is consistent throughout the entire book. <clears throat> the prophecies from Daniel, when he sees these metaphorical things, these beasts with horns and all these kind of things, we're told clearly that he's seeing these visions 
and the same with prophets in other scenarios. They were things they were visions they were seeing. They weren't literal things they saw. In contrast, Genesis is a historical book. It's not a book of prophecy. Everything else in the book is literal and historical. So why wouldn't chapter 1 and 2 be exactly the same? That's my personal view anyway. Now let's think about comparing evolution in the Bible a bit more. We consider the three main processes of evolutionary theory. The Big Bang, abiogenesis and evolution itself. Now let's briefly consider each of these alongside creation. And again, we're only going to think in broad brushstrokes and not look at any detail. So there really are two philosophies here, and you could even say two facts. In summary, one belief says God created the universe and everything in it for a purpose. But the opposing belief says that the universe and everything in it appeared randomly and has no purpose. Scientifically speaking, we have no complete comprehensive explanation of the how for either of these ideas, these beliefs. We can't explain the mechanics of how life came to be by belief in either creation or evolution. The Bible doesn't give us a recipe for life, but neither do evolutionary textbooks. If you think about it, the Big Bang Theory does not, by definition, exclude God. For example, there's a scientist by the name of Dr. Gerald Schroeder who actually believes that the Big Bang proves God. Um, this mention isn't, I'm just saying this not to promote any one view or anything like that, but just to highlight that there are many views and ideas out there. And to illustrate that there are scientists who believe in God and see scientific discoveries as ways to learn more about God's creation rather than ways to debunk it. So Dr. Schroeder, he um, received a PhD in nuclear physics and earth and planetary sciences in 1965 from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also known as MIT, you might have heard of it. He then worked there for five years on the staff of MIT in the physics department. He was also a member of the United States Atomic Energy Commission. Now he has a very interesting perspective. I don't know enough about the theory behind it to argue whether he's right or not, but it's just very interesting to look at his argument. So he says that not very long ago, like 50 years ago, that science said that there was no origin of the universe. The universe was eternal. It had always been there. However, in more recent times, the Big Bang Theory has come to the fore and it says that the universe has a beginning. Compare that to Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, here's a diagram of the universe and the Big Bang. On this diagram, we have this expanding tube with white grid lines around it. And this, this is the universe. That white glow on the left edge of the tubing is the beginning of the universe, or the Big Bang, if you will. Now, the space around that tube is nothing. I mean... I've said this before, space is a vacuum, but that only actually exists inside the universe and is something, while outside the universe there is absolutely nothing. Now, human minds trying to comprehend nothing is um, almost impossible. We can't think of nothing because we can't relate that to anything. There is always something. We have never experienced absolute nothing. But anyway, this doctor says that science has discovered God. In summary, he explains it the following way. He says, The universe allows the creation of physical things out of absolute nothing if you have the forces of quantum physics and the laws of relativity. Science calls these forces quantum fluctuations or, in more simple term, the laws of nature. <clears throat> so these laws of nature are forces that are not physical, instead they act on the physical and they create the physical from absolutely nothing. These forces created the universe, therefore they existed before the universe and predate our understanding of time. So have a look at this list on the screen. Scientifically speaking, these forces are supposed to create the universe out of nothing. 
Now, Dr. Schroeder argues that if you look at this definition of the set of forces listed on the screen, that list is the biblical definition of God. He says science has discovered God, and God is the source of energy that created the universe in the event called the Big Bang. Here's something interesting to think about. Science and scientific discoveries really can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. In the end, there are really just two worldviews or two faiths. One that says God is the creator, and the other that says the universe blindly happened to develop to the way it is today. You really do, I believe, have to have faith in an evolutionary universe because there are so many unknowns in the evolutionary theory. We've considered abiogenesis and how despite many ideas, no one really knows where that original spark of life came from. How it is possible for something living to come out of non-living inorganic matter. And just to think about some of these big unknowns in evolution, I've put together, there's a little list here of things which <clears throat> ask questions of evolution. The first is, where are all the missing fossil records? There are many fossil, there should be many fossils of species transforming into other species, but they don't exist. Secondly, why are complex life forms found embedded upright through multiple rock layers covered in more primitive fossils above it? This doesn't doesn't this wreck the idea that the rock layers give us a ge geological timeline of you know, things evolving and becoming more complex? How can there be more primitive creatures on top of more complex creatures? Next of all, how, how do you get DNA? Natural selection acts on beneficial characteristics, and not information. DNA is a very complex storage system of information, but information means absolutely nothing without mechanisms to read and act on it. To do this job, you need specialised proteins, but the process of making these proteins require other proteins, and all these proteins are coded for by the DNA itself. So where did this complex code come from? The genetic code is far more complex than Morse code, but scientists are combing the skies with specialised equipment looking for any simple repetitive code in the universe, just so they can see if there is intelligent life out there. How is it that the intelligent of, intelligence of life within every single cell isn't properly acknowledged? Um, next interesting thing is how did two different genders evolve? Now, every time a new species evolved, a male and female version of the species would have to mutate at the same time. And they'd have to be compatible with each other for it to be able to breed and reproduce to pass on this new genetic material. They would have had to almost evolve in pairs. Um, the next last thing I found interesting was um, there was a scientific experiment which was done over 50 years where these fruit flies, which have a very short lifespan, were bred. And over a 50-year period, they bred 600 generations of these flies. But over this whole period, there was never any meaningful mutations which benefited the fly. Any mutations which happened ended up with killing the flies. There was nothing beneficial which happened in this process. There wasn't natural selection. Talking about natural selection, here again you can see the difference in the two worldviews. These are different perspectives on what scientific discoveries actually mean. We can see the process of natural selection at work artificially when animals are selectively bred to have certain characteristics. But all this does is select on existing genetic information. Where did that vast genetic variation come from in the first place? We don't see a lot of evidence of mutation prov providing all the vast collection of genetic variety. Just think about that fruit fly experiment. There wasn't much variety over that 600 generations. It, <clears throat> it seems like it would make sense for an intelligent creator who knows the future to create a mechanism which allows his creation to adapt to changing environments. 
we see natural selection allowing adaption within species, but we don't clearly see convincing evidence that allows the birth of a brand new species. The Genesis record specifically states that everything was made after its kind. Now I'm sorry for this rush, rush list of things. Delving into specific arguments wasn't the purpose of tonight and therefore I didn't dedicate much time to discussing these. But tonight I really wanted to look at what the Bible says about our origins. <clears throat> and for us to see that it's not just random, we, we do have a purpose, there is some point. More importantly, we, we have a hope. Please listen to some of our other talks and to find out more about what our hope is and how you can be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you for your words tonight, Josh. I think we can all clearly see how the Bible and evolution cannot agree. We would like to thank you all who have watched this presentation for joining us. And we have another presentation next week, which will be the 31st of May, God willing where John Nichols will, will be presenting on the subject of the purpose of marriage in the Bible, which should be another fascinating talk. We will now conclude this presentation with prayer. Dear God, we draw together now and we thank you for the words you have left us in the Bible, which we can freely read in our own language and learn from it and understand it. We pray that more people across the world may see the truth in your inspired word and understand that it truly is a book unlike any other. We know the days that we live in now are dark, but you have offered us a hope of something better. When the chaotic world we currently live in will be transformed by the return of your Son to this world, if we obey your commandments. We ask that you send your Son back soon. To establish your kingdom on earth that the entire world will know you. We ask this now in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.